Hey, hello and welcome to Stan the Energy Man here on another beautiful day in Hawaii. And I hear it's really nice in Austin, Texas today too. So we're going to jump right into visiting with our guest. The title of today's show is uh, basically Energy Without Wires or Power Without Wires. And that's because if you think about our energy situation in the U.S., we, we generally break it into what's on the grid and transportation fuels. So you either have gasoline or diesel or you have electricity running through wires. But we're moving quickly to pretty much all electric transportation and probably a different design on the grid. And as we move in that direction, you're going to see a lot more renewables and a lot more intermittent renewables in particular that need energy storage. And that energy storage, and when we transmit the energy, a lot of it won't be in wires. It'll be in gases and things like that. So today's program is a little bit different. It's about how we're going to be storing energy and how we're going to use that energy in transportation and grids. But storing energy um, in a gas is a lot different than storing it in a liquid. And uh, our guest today, Kevin Harris, is from uh, Hexagon a Group and uh, coming to us from Austin, Texas. So, uh, Kevin, thanks for being on the show today. I appreciate you being able to join us. And uh, um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself first? And uh, I know you actually work with my predecessor, Tom Quinn, so you've probably been in the hydrogen right. business even longer than me, and I'm pretty bullish on hydrogen, so I'm, I'm sure you, you are too. But uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, well, mechanical engineer by trade, uh, also have a business degree. I started in the hydrogen area around uh, the year 2000, so I'm um, getting close to 20 years there. And um, I'm doing more business development, uh, sales and marketing side of things. Um, but my technical background allows me to uh, work with uh, engineers as well. Hexagon itself is basically a composite pressure vessel company. They make uh, tanks, cylindrical tanks for natural gas and hydrogen primarily. Uh, we do some LPG as well. And those tanks can be found on onboard applications like on vehicles like cars and trucks and buses, um, but they can also be found at the fueling stations as well. Uh, we call that ground storage or stationary storage. Um, and then as well, we are involved with transport of hydrogen. So if you need to transport the hydrogen from the point of production to the refueling station, for example, uh, we have transport trailers that allow you to do that. Um, and as a side note, our, um, our Nor Norwegian uh, headquarters, uh, they make LPG tanks. So they do uh, barbecue tanks and, and they've made, uh, I think, uh, over 11 and a half uh, um, million of those uh, are out there right now, primarily in Europe, but they are coming to the States as well. All right. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about tanks. There's, there's all different kinds of tanks. I mean, we're kind of used to seeing welders with um, metal tanks and scuba, scuba divers with aluminum and steel tanks, but um, your tanks are specifically um, basically carbon fiber um, woven, or not woven, but spun uh, in specific shapes and, uh, and gives it some, some very specific advantages. But I know also that sometimes they come with liners, so like type three yes. and type four different. Can you kind of describe the difference between type sure. three and type four? Sure. So type three and type four are both uh, composite overwrapped uh, tanks that have a liner in them. And the liner is used basically to um, allow the hydrogen not to escape and the carbon fiber or the composite overwrap is used to hold in the pressure. A type three has an aluminum liner or a metal liner typically aluminum. And the type four tanks, which is what we do, have a plastic liner inside of them. Um, both are uh, very good in terms of uh, being more lightweight than a traditional steel tank. Um, but the automotive industry has basically, I would say the majority uh, has gone to type four tanks because of the lightness that they need. You don't want to be hauling around a lot of steel if you can uh, help it. You want to have more room for the payload itself, whether it's passengers or um, in a truck, the actual you know freight that it's carrying. 
So the type four is very good in terms of its uh, lightness, in terms that it doesn't have um, fatigue effects like uh, metal uh, containers do. Uh, so the type four is basically the lightness is what you get out of it. Are there, uh, on the type three tanks, are there any issues with embrittlement? Because to me, that's kind of a, not a controversial issue, but you know, I hear a lot mm -hmm. of people that, that really say embrittlement's a big deal and other engineers tell me it's not that big of a deal unless you have high pressure and high temperature uh, combined. So yes. what's, what's your company's take on, on metal as a, as a not so permeable membrane inside the tanks? Are they worried about embrittlement right, right. or anything? Well, with the type three tanks, they are, like I said, aluminum liners. So they don't have the embrittlement issue, or at least uh, probably not as bad as the steel uh, tanks. Um, I will say though, that um, I have heard that there's certain steels that um, reduce the embrittlement uh, risk. Uh, and so uh, it's possible that they can do it as well. But the fact that there is um, essentially no metal in our tanks, there, there is some metal on what we call the bosses, which is the ends where the actual like piping would be connected to the right. tank. Um, and that's typically stainless steel for, for hydrogen. So there's no embrittlement issues uh, for us uh, per se. So, but it's definitely something that you always have to think about as an engineer. Uh, you have to look at all the failure modes and embrittlement is just one of those things and one of those things you don't have to worry about with our particular tanks. So your tanks are um, in many cases made for hydrogen um, at fairly high pressures. I, I know that we consider low pressure between maybe 100 and 350 bar, uh, which is around up to 5,000 PSI. And then 700 right. bar is uh, high pressure at 10,000 PSI. I know that we have storage yes. tanks that are stationed at Hickam that go up to 12,000 PSI, but that's their rated pressure um, capacity. Um, but the tanks are actually mm -hmm. certified to hold, I mean, if they're rated at 10 or 12,000 PSI, what's their actual yes. failure, failure pressure? And what kind of pad right. do the engineers build into those tanks? Yeah, so it depends on the code that you're building to, but typically you will have um, what we call a stress ratio or a, a, a burst to service ratio of two and a quarter to three. So if your tank is designed for, let's say, 5,000 PSI, uh, the burst would happen at, you know, upwards of like 12,000 or even um, 15,000 PSI. So that's how much of a safety factor is put into those uh, tanks. Uh, to me, that's important because that's a big comfort uh, factor as, as we try and get the public to um, appreciate the safety um, margins that are put into uh, tanks and other, other parts of uh, hydrogen vehicles. Um, and, yes. you know, that's, you know, I, I'm a former scuba diver. I, I got certified back yeah. in the 60s. And, you know, we, we were always scared to death of about 2,500 PSI in a scuba tank. You know, because it'll take, right. you know, you knock the valve off, it'll, it'll take off and start zooming around the room. Um, right, right. Yeah. So it, it, it's critical. And, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, I just came back from the hydrogen merit review and you were there um, in D.C. Yes. And were you in the briefings where the Army showed them uh, shooting rounds at the, at the tanks? Yes, I was there. Were, were, were those your tanks? Or um those were not our tanks actually um but i can tell you that um we have one tank that's rated at 950 bar and it's used for stationary um and there is one test we have to go through it's called the um the, the gunfire test or the, the bullet test and that test is basically used to see that if a if a bullet pierces the tank that the tank won't uh be destroyed basically there'll be a leak just through the right. the bullet hole if you will um our 950 tank 950 bar tank for example uh goes through this test and we found it to be literally bulletproof they tried to penetrate and they could not penetrate the side of the tank and that tells you the strength of that carbon fiber and also i've seen um vehicles that have had tanks i'm not sure if it was our tank but it was a, it was a carbon fiber tank of uh of one manufacturer or another 
and they had like a caterpillar type vehicle, like a bulldozer or a tank or something like that, that has run over that tank. The car is completely flattened except for a small bulge in the back. And that's where the hydrogen tank is located and, uh, you know, undamaged. So very, very strong. Yeah, I was really impressed when the Army did uh, showed the videos. And, and so whether they were your tanks or not, I was just super impressed. Because like you say, they're, yeah. they're virtually indestructible. And to give the audience an idea of what the, what the series was, the first thing they did was they shot um, basically a 30 caliber, 30-06 round or 308 round through a, a tank, and it bounced off the tank. Then they took an armor-piercing 30 caliber round and shot it. It went through the tank but it just let the gas out. Then they took a 30 caliber armor piercing high, in, high explosive incendiary round and fired it through the tank. And it went through the tank and it started a, a fire, but it was like a blowtorch and it burned for 10 minutes and then it went out. And in all these three tests, the tank was virtually there intact, except for the 30 caliber hole in and the 30 caliber hole out, which is what you described. Yes. What I thought was really uh, intriguing was what they did after that because these guys are like myth busters on steroids. They, they couldn't do it with a yeah. bullet. So they took a RPG warhead and they pointed it straight at the uh, tangent of the tank and they set it off. And you just see this massive explosion that fills the camera up with, with a big flash and dust and yeah. everything. And the dust finally clears and there's like a two inch hole going in and a two inch hole coming out and the tank is still sitting there. Right. And we're all just rolling right. on the floor thinking this is hilarious because <laughs> you know, they're, they're trying their hardest to destroy this tank and they can't do it. And then finally, they take a bunch of C4 or plastic explosive and pack it all around That's the right. tank and they set it off and, and they managed to actually damage the tank. But it, most of it was still sitting there strapped to the pallet with metal straps. Right. I, I just thought we, we, by then we were in tears about how funny this was because yeah. the Army tried their darndest to, to destroy this tank and they couldn't do it. So. Uh, my yeah. my um, comfort level with the safety and security of uh, of your your style tanks is uh, is just I have no question about the safety of it at all, and uh, it's a very comforting yeah. feeling. But let's let's yeah, move absolutely. to I mean, oh go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say I mean the automotive companies um, I mean they they have uh, they're gonna have liabilities as they sell these vehicles to the to the general public, and so they wouldn't put this type of technology in there if there was uh, you know any risk at all. So um, that's very telling that the, the automotive OEMs are, are using these tanks in their fuel yeah, cell vehicles. I agree. You know, out here in Hawaii, we've had some vehicles, you're familiar with some of the hydrogen vehicles that Tom Quinn had yep. uh, underway out here. And so we've had fire department and um, federal fire and state fire and county fire folks all trained in responding to hydrogen vehicle fires. But, you know, just the process of getting um, transportable tanks through the Federal Department of Transportation wickets and test them um, is a challenge in itself. And so um, could you give us a, an idea of what it takes to get your equipment through those rigors on the federal side? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the key takeaway really here is that because we're building a pressure vessel, we're, we're very heavily regulated, um, you know, for good reasons. Back back in the 1800s when they had boilers and whatnot uh, that weren't made to any codes, they would explode all the time and uh, people would get injured. So um, there are a variety of codes and standards that we must adhere to depending on the application. And um, we have a team of people with over, a hundred person years of experience in dealing with these uh, codes and standards. Um, but in any case, that is really in the whole product development when we're developing a new tank, that is the bottleneck, if you will, um, in getting uh, our product out to market. So one example, going back to this 950 bar tank, um, the D, we, we wanted to get DOT approval, meaning that we can use this tank as a, in a transport trailer. Uh, that took almost two years to uh, get through the system, uh, probably because it was the highest uh, pressure rating that, that they had dealt with at the Department of Transportation. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, education involved. There's a lot of 
testing uh, that has to be done. Like I mentioned, the, the, the gunfire test, there's a bonfire test, there's an acid test, there's a torque test, there's, there's uh, quite a few tests that, that have to get done. Um, so it's important to know that because um, if someone comes up to and comes up to our company and says, I'd like to buy a tank and I want you to custom make it to a certain diameter, a certain length, um, just know that because we have to adhere to these codes yeah. and standards, we have to do a whole bunch of tests. So that's going to take quite a bit of time. Um, and so iterating is not difficult. It's just, it takes more time. So to do a tank and then change the tank dimensions, unfortunately, we have to go through a lot of the tests, if not all the tests uh, over again. So that, that, that can be difficult, but with, with the experienced people we have on board, uh, I think we're uh, a leader in terms of not only working with codes and standards, but actually developing them uh, as well on a, on a global scale. Okay, well, we hit up the midpoint of the show here. We're gonna take a 60 second break and be back with Kevin and talk to him a little bit more about uh, some of the safety aspects of these tanks. Aloha, I'm Cynthia Sinclair. And I'm Tim Abicella. We are hosts here at Think Tech Hawaii, a digital media company serving the people of Hawaii. We provide a video platform for citizen journalists to raise public awareness in Hawaii. We are a Hawaii nonprofit that depends on the generosity of its supporters to keep on going. We'd be grateful if you'd go to thinktechhawaii.com and make a donation to support us now. Thanks, Thanks so, so much. much. <laughs> Aloha and mabuhai. My name is Emmy Ortega Anderson, inviting you to join us every Tuesday here on Pinoy Power Hawaii with Think Tech Hawaii. We come to your home at 12 noon every Tuesday. We invite you to uh, listen, watch uh, for our mission of empowerment. We aim to enrich, enlighten, educate, entertain, and we hope to empower. Again, maraming salamat po. Mabuhay and aloha. Hey, welcome back to my lunch hour on Stan Energy Man here. And we've got Kevin Harris over in Austin, Texas, talking to us about um, storage tanks for my favorite element in the world, H2, hydrogen. And... Um, we were talking about some of the rigors that the tanks have to go through for Department of Transportation testing to go on highways. And um, one of the things I was curious about, Kevin, is I'm not sure if you guys make the valves that go on the end of the tanks or you contract that out, but um, can you give us an idea of some of the safety features that those pieces of the tank have? Yeah, we don't supply those uh, components themselves, but uh, they have their own set of um, tests that they have to go through. They actually use similar testing service suppliers uh, that we use. Um, but that's, uh, you know, when you're dealing with these high pressures, you safety has to come first and they have to go through those tests and ensure that um, it's, it's going to work um, out, out, you know, in the, in the public. So definitely uh, they have to go through some tests and, and, you know, we're obviously thankful for that because a lot of times, we're not just building the tank itself, we're building a tank system. Uh, so in a bus or, or in a class A truck, for example, um, the OEM will want to have not just the tank, but they'll want to have the, the, the valving, the um, plumbing that goes around that, uh, perhaps even a fire protection system. And uh, so we work with those uh, sub suppliers, if you will, to build up the system and uh, yes, they have to go through their own tests. Okay, hey, and I was gonna ask you this before the break, um, or just for the folks that aren't mechanical engineers or, or aren't familiar, 950 bar is your, your highest pressure tank. How, how many pounds per square inch pressure is that? That is 13,775, if I'm not mistaken. So just under 14,000 PSI, which is yes. a lot of pressure. And, and why, would, yeah, why would you want to use that? It would be because, you know, people don't realize that when you have a liquid tank and you just start taking fuel out of it, the fuel level lowers down and eventually you run out of fuel. But when you're working with a gas, 
the gas tends to stay at a uniform pressure in the tank. So as you're dispensing, the pressure drops. And when you're trying to squeeze that into a car, that's 10,000 mm -hmm. PSI. If you start with 10,000 PSI pressure and you start filling the tank, you're going to be below 10,000 PSI in a couple seconds. And you'll, right. you'll never get to the 10,000 PSI. So you start off with a higher pressure, like 12 or 13,000 PSI, and you start filling the vehicle and you can get it to 10,000 PSI and do things like cascade fills that we call and, and right. try and get the max amount of, uh, of pressure into the vehicle. So yeah. what, what are the different size, you, you folks build some trailers that are commercially available. What are the different yes. size trailers that you build in terms of kilograms on a, on a set of trailer uh, wheels? Yeah, well, we have a, a trailer called a, a Titan trailer. And if you can envision um, a 40 foot trailer um, or a larger one at 53 feet long uh, and picture four tubes on that trailer, each tube being around 52 feet long and having a diameter of about three and a half feet. Uh, you have four of those tubes on there. And um, we're working on getting that one certified for hydrogen. And you could expect to carry 860 kilograms or so of uh, hydrogen on board. And those tanks are operating at approximately 250 bar. Okay. Is there a plan to try and get that size tank to a higher pressure? Um, yeah, we have um, uh, plans, I guess, or um, visions of getting to uh, higher pressures. Uh, 500 bar, for example, uh, seems to be a popular spot. But we recently got a special permit from the Department of Transportation, as I said before, to move around the 950 bar tanks. So we could build a, a tank if we if we see the, the market is there or if we had a customer who wanted us to build that, we could build a, a transport trailer full of 950 bar tanks. And then that could allow having a larger compressor at the production site, hydrogen production site, and then potentially no compressor at the hydrogen refuel site. Department of Energy um, week there, we saw that compressors uh, make up, uh, as far as the capital cost, uh, basically the highest portion of the, of the station. So imagine if you could get rid of that compressor um, and just have 950 bar tanks uh, on trailers uh, used at the hydrogen station and have that cascading, as you say, into a 700 bar tank that's, that's on the vehicle. Uh, so that's something, you know, I want to get into with uh, potential customers and see if there's an appetite for that type of uh, paradigm, uh, if you will. And, and what's the smallest trailer that you folks make commercially? And if you, if, and then do any, does anybody make trailers with your tanks that are um, like on a pickup truck scale or, you know, a smaller scale? Right. Well, the smallest one we have is a 20 foot container. Um, and, uh, I, you know, to be honest, I think it holds around, um, uh, 350 kilograms or so of hydrogen at, at 250 bar. Uh, and then we have a European, uh, uh, version as well. But as far as something on a pickup truck, we do have what I call a mini container for, uh, air the kid, one of the industrial gas companies. And that two 950 bar tanks, it holds a total of 24 kilograms and they're using it in a mobile hydrogen refueling trailer. So uh, they can now move this trailer around to places that um, they want to have a hydrogen refueler, but maybe can't afford to put in a permanent fixed station at this point. They can have this mobile trailer and once um, the amount of fuel cell vehicle increases to the point where it justifies a permanent station, then they can move that trailer to another location to further extend the coverage of the hydrogen station network to allow people to go uh, further out uh, from uh, the, let's say, the center of, of, the, of the network. So that two tank, 950 bar mini container, it's about 10 foot long, um, maybe two feet high, uh, 
four or five feet wide. Uh, that's something that, that could go on a pickup truck. And that's exactly why I asked the question, because Hawaii is in its uh, infant stages of standing up stations. So we have one commercially available station stood up by Surfco Hawaii, the main Toyota um, dealer here on this island. And um, right. we're looking for other ways to kind of bring hydrogen in at the pace of the demand. And right now, we, we don't have demand for 900 um, kilograms of hydrogen at a pop. Um, but, you know, right. but high pressure and a small volume would be, would be really handy. You know, we're really actually getting yeah. close to our end time. And I wanted to talk a little bit about stationary. But how adaptable yeah. are your, um, your, your um, cylinders, your storage containers, for larger scale, like grid scale hydrogen storage? Uh, I mean, there's uh, you can use multiples just like, you know, the, the, the Tesla vehicle uses, uh, I don't know how many hundreds of those like D cell batteries, at least that's my understanding. Um, the same thing can be used for ours. Um, but what I would suggest is the transport trailers themselves, they are, they use the tanks in a container that you put on a trailer. So theoretically, you could take the 45 uh, the 40 foot container that holds um, in that case, like around uh, 800 or so kilograms, or you can take a 53 foot, which is closer to 900 kilogram. These are ISO containers. So you can stack these uh, potentially six or seven high. So it would be very easy, very modular to take, um, let, let's say 500, 600 kilograms per container, and then multiply that by however many containers you need and stack them high and save real estate. Um, and then you could have very large scale uh, hydrogen storage. And, you know, we're talking to, to wind developers, uh, people who are, who are making hydrogen through electrolysis um, at large scale, and they need to have a place to, to put it. And what the nice thing is, is if it's on a trailer chassis, uh, they can use that as ground storage as they fill them up. And then, they can just hook them up to a truck and then the truck can bring them to the users of the hydrogen, which could probably be fuel uh, vehicle fueling or could be um, the steel uh, mills. It could be the refineries or ammonia plants, uh, something on the industrial side of things. Um, the other thing, too, is that the 950 bar, which is used uh, in these transports, uh, they can be used in stationary storage as well. So once you get past the stage of not needing the temporary stations, you can use those 950 bar tanks, for example, in a stationary permanent station if you so desire. Great. Well, Leo and I, Kevin, we've blasted through 30 minutes talking about hydrogen wow. storage tanks. And, you know, I feel like I've learned a lot from you and I'll definitely be on, uh, on the phone or on the emails with you talking about what they cost because I think we're going to end up needing some here in Hawaii. But thanks so much for your time today and, uh, and cluing us in on the inside story with um, a tough storage problem, hydrogen and high pressure. So thanks again, and uh, we'll, we'll uh, talk to you again. I'm sure I'll have you on the show again, because this was fascinating. Perfect, well, thank you for having me. Really uh, appreciate it. Sorry I couldn't be in Hawaii. Yeah, well, you have to come out in person next time. Absolutely, that's the plan. Okay, and to everyone out there in viewer land, thanks to Robert in the control room, and Cindy here miking me up and everything, and we'll see you next Friday, aloha.